Victoria Marchese from uh, the University of Maryland. She's the um, Vice Chair for Academic Affairs for the Department of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Services at the University of Maryland. And uh, she's going to be talking about, um, we were talking before, cancer survivorship, uh, particularly pediatric uh, leukemia uh, survivors and, and the role of exercise there. Thank you, Dr. Marchese. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me here today. So I'm going to talk about uh, why. Why do we study movement and exercise in pediatric oncology? We know that children are physically active. They should be running and jumping rope and swimming and playing and climbing trees. So while they're receiving chemotherapy and treatment for their cancer, are we encouraging them to do these activities to keep along their normal motor milestones? The number of children diagnosed with cancer exceeds 15,000 a year. The most common are children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The others are lymphoma and solid tumors in the CNS and in a bone. Acute ALL is the most common pediatric cancer, with the peak incidences occurring in children between the ages of two and three years of age. We think of how long their treatment lasts. It typically lasts a good three years for boys and two years for girls. So during that period, there should be a lot of growth and development, strength gains, endurance gains that should be occurring. The medical treatment, of course, then and the cancer itself can cause side effects, but such as decreased balance, range of motion, primarily in the ankles because of the vincristine, can cause a peripheral neuropathy, leading to decreased ankle dorsiflexion range of motion. Some of the medications, such as methotrexate, can lead to more central CNS processing disorders can cause poor motor planning, processing speed, decreased motor proficiency, decreased strength, endurance, and limitations in mobility, and increase in body mass. I wanted to show you a brief clip. I have some of my PT students I see over there, and they've seen this video. This is a little girl who had leukemia, and she was in the maintenance phase of the treatment. And this will give you a little perspective of what the children look like while they're getting treatment. Might break up the morning, too. Watch a video. Her name's Emily. She's wearing the ankle foot orthoses because of the vincristine peripheral neuropathy. Once her treatment ended, she did not need these AFOs. Years ago, it was thought that vincristine peripheral neuropathy would completely reside. Okay, so what did you just hear her say? I know I only have 15 minutes to talk and five minutes for questions, but I have to play that piece. Right, so am I taking, her mom's taking a video for me, and she's doing this so I can be happy, right? This is why I do this research. This is, I love this. Here she is. She's finished with treatment, finished with chemotherapy. She's on the baseball field. Her parents have bought her this snazzy pink helmet. So is she actually on the field, just on the field participating, or is she running the bases as fast as she can, like her friends, as her peers would do? So the benefits of exercise, you've heard it all morning. Exercise, right? If we could just get people to participate. We know the adult oncology literature supports exercise, including yoga, inter, um, interval training, all kinds of strengthening programs. The body of literature is growing in pediatric population as well. We've seen improvements in self-efficacy, self-concept, cardiopulmonary endurance, flexibility, sleep efficiency. Pam Hines has explored that. Body mass index, health-related quality of life. Some of my studies and others, mine was looking at does it actually impact blood counts when children are receiving chemotherapy because, of course, the oncologists want to know, is this safe? Is it feasible without harming their um, system? And my study had shown it doesn't impact the hemoglobin, and other studies have appeared to show the same outcome in survivorship. 
Dr. Rubel right here at Johns Hopkins. She's used an intervention study that uses a five-day camp with follow-up treatments. They were looking at children that had <clears throat> decreased moderate to vigorous active physical activity levels. Lee also looks at these integrative adventure training camps. So I've heard a lot this morning about trying to get people to actually participate in exercise. We have a hard enough time as adults. I have a gym right on campus that I know I can go to every day. Do I? I used to work. My office was right next to the gym. I'd walk right by it and feel guilty that I hadn't gone exercised. How do we do that in children? We get them rock climbing. My studies now look at jumping rope and engage them and get them more participating with their friends. So my research has been primarily for the last 15, oh, long time now, over 15 years, looking at children with ALL and lower extremity sarcoma and during their treatment and now focusing after their treatment. I've primarily focused on strengthening exercises, range of motion exercises, flexibility, and cardiopulmonary. You know, there's a lot of great exercise physiologists researchers in the room, and you would think that I could modify my intervention enough where they would get strength, they would get cardiopulmonary gains. The problem is we typically, historically, have not encouraged our children to exercise at a high enough level of cardio to get those cardiopulmonary gains. Of course, this is my daughter. She's brought into my lab on a regular basis. What am I studying now? Postural control and movement analysis measures in children that have completed medical tr treatment for ALL. So I'm looking at posture, movement, coordination patterns, so I can better identify what intervention, what exercise is going to be the most efficient and effective to assist these children who, if you saw, there's healthcare professionals here that have had leukemia and lymphoma. They're walking, they're running, but are they doing that at a high level in, the, in their performance? So my current study, which I've uh, fortunately just received funding for, um, we've looked at children between 6 and 17 years of age within five years of completing medical treatment. I have a motion analysis lab over at the University of Maryland, right downtown, right here in Baltimore. I have a sample that I'm going to show you today of 12 participants. We have six children who are um, survivors of leukemia and age and gender match norms and the range of four to 26 months from completion of treatment. My outcome measures, goniometry to measure active ankle dorsiflexion, because I already mentioned the limitation from the Christine Peripheral Neuropathy supposed to resolve. Brunitz Oscar SD test of motor proficiency, looking at the balance subtest specifically, timed up and go to look at basic functional ability. Our gait right, somebody spoke this morning already about gait parameters, I look at cadence, step length, stride length, velocity. We've got a great lab. We can use kinematic and kinetic data. So I have a icon motion analysis system. And I use the four force plate, and I'll show you how I use that a little bit later on. And EMG data. I want to know when are the muscles firing? When are they relaxing? How quickly before the jump? Are they preparing the movement? Are they co-contracting? Are they able to isolate the movements that they need to? This slide, interestingly enough, looks at, we have ankle range of motion. Let's see, right here. This is the ALL CCSS group. And these are the age and gender match norms. This is the right in the dark and the left in the light. So they're pretty symmetrical. But as you can see, we have neutral, which is the zero value. And above neutral, the 20 here, is actually active ankle dorsiflexion. Below the zero is in a plantar flexion range. So with the knee extended, these children and teens are not even able to actively dorsiflex, dorsiflex their ankle to a neutral alignment. Same with the bot, the Brunix, the test of motor proficiency. We have our ALLCCSS group and our age and gender match control group. Now, these are only 12 participants, and we are finding significant differences between the groups. And I can't reiterate enough, if you see these children coming to your clinic for long-term follow-up survivorships with Kathy Rubel, you would not even think that they had motor deficits or would have problems with basic exercise, swimming, soccer, or timed up and go. Just to refresh your memory, the timed up and go, you sit in a chair, you stand up, you walk three meters, you turn around and sit down. Significant difference in how much time it takes to just simply walk three meters. You may ask yourself, clinically, 
or in the community, what does that make a difference for these few seconds? Any of you remember high school when you had to get from one class to another in five minutes, you had to go to the bathroom, go to the locker, talk to your friends. So a few seconds on walking and a few seconds going up downstairs does make a big difference in somebody's social in high school, in middle school years. Step length. This is a small sample of four participants. I had one participant who was our rock star. She was amazing, and her control was a really active, vibrant young girl. So you can see some variability. But the step length is typically greater in our typically developing children. Little videos. Love these videos. This is from my uh, motion capturing system. Uh, there's this run. Okay. So we have on this video is showing our child who has had leukemia. The other video is the age and gender match norm. If we break these characteristics down, if you look at their head, this participant is looking around. Where am I in space? You should be thinking about their proprioception. Are they having some proprioception deficits? I did do a Proprioception measure just as your foot up, as your foot down. Is it sensitive enough? No. Where are their arms? Where are their hips? Where are they in space? Where are they landing on their feet? Is it efficient? And why do I care about this in relationship to exercise? What, ac what activities do you do in your daily life for your children or your friend's children that requires jumping? Most sports these days, even volleyball, you have to be able to really get a power jump. To, I don't play volleyball, so don't get me on my volleyball skills and terminology. Basketball, all kinds of things, even things children play on the playground. Running. Participant one, the child with leukemia, who had leukemia, as compared to the age and gender matched. Look at the running pattern. Look at their arms. How much rotation do we have? What's the trunk flexion? How much leaning forward do we have? What about the in-flight phase? In-flight phase meaning when both feet are off the ground. If you're going to play lacrosse, you're going to play lacrosse here in Baltimore, right? Or in Philadelphia or in D.C., anywhere, really. I grew up in the South. Even lacrosse is popular now in the South. can't believe it. But um, you need to be able to run, and you need to be able to run efficiently. What do we have here with a, one other participant? I thought I'd give you a little bit, show you the variability. This is our child who had leukemia as compared to the age and gender matched. The typical developing child still does not have a typical running pattern with her arms. She's not crossing midline. She's not using her arms efficiently. However, you can see the in-flight phase is greater. She's more efficient in her running pattern. The, per the child who had had leukemia is using her arms to really swing and help her to achieve that momentum. So we go on and think about differences in jump height. So in my study, it's taken me a little time to get my colleagues on board on the why do we care about jump height. I think I've got them sold on this idea now. Jump height. Obviously, the children who had leukemia are not jumping as high as the age and gender matched. But what about when we look at torque. And we look at, so normalized maximum joint torque. So I have them on the force plate, and I have the Vicon, so we're able to measure maximal force when they're right before they're getting ready to perform the jump. So I've got the force pressure going down on the force plate, and I have my Vicon data to tell me the speed of jumping. So I'm able to, to gather some torque information while they're performing the activity. EMG. I want to know what the muscles are doing right before the jump. <laughs> so about 500 milliseconds right before the jump is performed. I want to know what muscles are activating. So here I'm looking at the soleus, the gastrocnemius, and the anterior tip. This slide is indicative of the vincristine peripheropathy. So we have some neuropathy effects. That well-published data supports we have the anterior tibialis still affected in our survivorship population. So what do we have to look at? We have to think about what type of exercise, specific type of exercise, that's going to focus on strength, range of motion, endurance, and function. And how do we make it to where it's fun for the children to participate? 
uh, fortunately, this I just mentioned I have gotten some funding, and I'm doing this over at the University of Maryland, but in collaboration with Kathy Rubel here at Hopkins. And we're looking at the jumping rope study. People say, well, I applied to NIH, and one of the reviewers said, jumping rope is not novel. And if you're the reviewer in this room, I'd love to talk to you. I know we're not allowed to do that, but um, you could just say you weren't the reviewer. Correct. Jumping. I probably shouldn't even have said that comment, but anyway. Um, jumping rope, yes, it's not novel. It's novel in this population, how we're studying it, how we're using it scientifically. So when we think about jumping rope, what does it do? It brings in weight bearing. So these children have risk of osteoporosis. We need to get weight bearing. We need to make it fun. We want to work on timing and coordination. If, when was the last time any of you guys jumped rope? Some people are raising their hand, right? So you have to think about the timing, the coordination. Can you do it for so many seconds? So for my grant that I wrote, we had to make sure that we had the bouts of exercise in there. How long were they going to do it? How are we going to measure their energy expenditure and our outcome? So when I think about, in summary, with this population, what do we need to do? We need to see them when they're initially diagnosed. I want to see them throughout their treatment. I want to see them when they're finished because the intervention that you give in exercise during treatment is very different than the intervention you're going to give after treatment. Here in NASA St. Jude, I used to work there for four years. And it was a fabulous place. They're still doing it. They are doing amazing work looking at survivorships. So Carrie's studies, and Dr. Nessa's studies, and Dr. Robeson and epidemiology and cancer control are exploring some energy, some fatigue, some exercises where they can look at heart function because we know that children who have had leukemia, they can, anthracyclines can impact their heart function. So in my last slide, obviously thanking the children and the families, and Rob Kreft is at the University of Maryland. He helps me analyze the data, and Vicki Gray and a funding source, the American Physical Therapy Association has been very supportive and four diamonds at Penn State Children where I was before. So with that, I'd like to open up any questions. I could have gone much longer, but I know we've got to move on to the next, right? Okay, great. Nope. Yes. Yes, so it's a wonderful question. Interestingly enough, a new study that Dr. Ness out of St. Jude has published, not only does it persist, but there's early frailty. So you have somebody who had leukemia when they were two and three years old. They make a few gains, but then by the time they're 30, when I say early frailty, if you think about how old we are in the room, early frailty already starting in their 30s. So then we bring on a whole host of other problems. They're already at risk for osteoporosis. They already have decreased muscle strength, decreased muscle mass. They have metabolic complications. And we're rounding into their 30s where we already know bone mass is going to be naturally decreasing. Then we have a different set of interventions that we need to be focusing on, fall prevention, as you're going to hear today. Good question. Okay. Very good. Thank you.